This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Hey, Tanya. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am doing just fine. Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of Crimes and Consequences. Before I tell you the story today, I'm just going to remind everyone to hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to. And Talia, today our story takes place on the morning of February 3rd, 1997. On that morning, Yolanda Gutierrez, her Chicago apartment was set on fire. Yolanda lived there with her 10-year-old daughter, Jessica Muniz. The fire was first noticed by one of Yolanda's neighbors, and he called for fire rescue. When the firefighters arrived, they found the bodies of Yolanda and Jessica on a burned bed. The fire was investigated by a cause and origin investigator with the Chicago Fire Department, and he noted poor patterns which indicated that an accelerant was used on the rug around the bed. He also observed what appeared to be a restraint on Jessica's wrists. In his opinion, the fire resulted from the deliberate act of pouring a liquid accelerant onto the bed and onto the victims, and (gasps) then the accelerant was set on fire. Onto the victims? Yes. Oh, man. I know. When autopsies were performed on Yolanda and Jessica, Yolanda's body was clad in burned and fragmented clothing, and she had a gaping wound on her neck that cut her carotid artery and jugular vein. The wound went deep through the front muscles of the neck, through the large side muscle of the neck, and to the back of the throat. About half of her body had been extensively burned, and it was charred. Her vaginal opening was open, which was consistent with sexual assault. Oh, man. I know. The medical examiner determined that her cause of death, though, was from her throat being slashed and loss of blood, so it wasn't from the fire. I don't I mean, I know. It, uh, it's all bad. Jessica, like her mother, wore fragmented burned clothing. She also had a huge wound across her neck and was nearly decapitated. And you said they were side by side on this bed? Yes. About 75% of her body was burned. In addition, on her shoulder was a stab wound two inches by one inch and one inch deep. During the exam for the autopsy, a tampon with the plastic applicator still on it fell from her vagina. What? Mm Mm-hmm. What? That's why. Well, you'll tell me. Yes, I will tell you. It's fucking weird, though, right? Two areas of tearing on her vaginal opening were evident, consistent with sexual assault. In addition, there was redness in the upper and lower parts of her anus, again, consistent with sexual assault. In the back of Jessica's throat, there was an area of purple hemorrhage that could have been caused by the insertion of an adult penis into her mouth, like into the back of her throat. How do they know this stuff? I know, right? It's crazy. Like, Ah, how do they know? The medical examiner found a pulmonary foam from her lungs in her airways and observed that her brain was swollen. The swelling indicated a loss of oxygen to the brain. And at the time Jessica's throat was slashed, her brain was deprived of oxygen. The medical examiner believed it would take approximately three to five minutes of oxygen deprivation for her to die from her injuries or suffer irreversible brain damage. The coroner took rectal, vaginal, and oral swabs from both Yolanda and Jessica. Semen was only found on the swabs taken from Jessica's rectal and oral swabs, with blood showing on all three of her swabs and all swabs taken from Yolanda. A male DNA profile was obtained from Jessica's oral swabs and a profile of the perpetrator was developed. What year did you say this was again? 97. Okay. Eventually, the DNA was matched to a man named Paul Runge, but it would take a few years. I believe they finally matched it around 2001. On June 7, 2001, Detective Frank Capitelli in the Chicago Police Department questioned Paul in the Will County Jail. 
Initially, Paul denied any knowledge of the murders. However, when Detective Capitelli confronted him with the crime lab reports and the DNA evidence, he looked at the reports for a period of time, and then Paul said, quote, you know I did it, you got me, end quote. Yeah, well, I mean, it's pretty, it's it's, pretty yeah, obvious. Yeah, DNA don't lie. Subsequently, the state's attorney met with him and went over the lab report with him. The prosecutor stated that the semen in Jessica's mouth was Paul's, and he agreed. And then he agreed to make a videotaped statement. In the statement, Paul admitted that on January 31st, 1997, he contacted Yolanda Gutierrez about a Hooked on Phonics program she was advertising for sale. Do you remember those Hooked on Phonics? Of course I do. (laughs) That was a big thing, man. Mm -hmm. He went to her apartment and discussed the program with her and then said he would discuss it with his wife and he left. And Paul is married at the time. So Paul said he and his wife Charlene went to Yolanda's apartment on February 3rd to view the program. According to him, Charlene argued with Yolanda and grabbed her. Paul claimed that Yolanda grabbed a knife and told Charlene to leave. Paul grabbed the knife from Yolanda and pushed her to the floor. He asked Charlene for something to tie up Yolanda and Charlene brought him duct tape, which he used to tie Yolanda and Jessica's hands. Paul then put Yolanda and Jessica on the bed and attempted to calm Charlene down. Then he had sex with her on the bed between Yolanda and Jessica. What? Oh, my God. I know. Then he pulled down Yolanda's shorts and had vaginal, anal, and oral sex with her. Then he pulled down Jessica's sweatpants and had the same, raped her as well. And then he said he pulled her pants up afterward and cut Yolanda's throat with a knife and cut Jessica's throat. According to him, Charlene came to him with a can of turpentine-like fluid that he poured on the bed and onto Jessica and Yolanda. He ignited the bed with a match, and he and Charlene left. Three days later, on June 10th, 2001, Detective Capitelli interviewed Charlene, who now is Paul's ex-wife. And he asked her about her involvement in these murders because, you know, Paul said this story. She's like, I wasn't there. I wasn't involved. So subsequently... Detective Capitelli spoke to Paul and said, look, your ex-wife said she wasn't there, so what the hell? Eventually, Paul admitted that he'd lied about Charlene's participation. Why? Why did he put I that? I don't know, right? To make it sound like he wasn't such a fucking dick? I don't know. Hmm. He admitted she wasn't present when he committed the crimes. Paul then gave a second statement where he said, yep, I went to Yolanda's apartment alone this time on February 3rd having been there previously on January 31st, at which time he discussed the Hooked on Phonics program. And that's when he saw both Yolanda and Jessica. So wait, this time he wasn't invited to be there? Right. Got it. He showed up. On the later date, he entered the apartment intending to rape Yolanda, and he had duct tape and a knife in his coat pocket. Once inside the apartment, he closed the door, pulled out the knife, and grabbed Yolanda around the front, placing the knife to her throat. Paul told Yolanda to be quiet and come to the bed and to direct Jessica to do the same. Once he had both Yolanda and Jessica on the bed, he taped their hands behind their backs. Then he raped them. Poor women, man. I know. And her child, her 10-year-old. Oh, my God. I forgot she's done. Yeah, she's only 10. Oh, my God. I know. He raped them all, vaginally, anally, and orally. Oh, Tanya, this is so heartbreaking. I know. It's awful. Although he said he didn't recall ejaculating, he admitted he must have, since semen was present. After he had intercourse with the little girl, she was bleeding from her vagina. So in response, he found a tampon oh, and inserted okay. it into uh, her vagina. What? With the applicator what? and everything. I, why? why? Why would you? Why? What is that? I know. I don't even understand. Like, what is that covering up? Uh, I, I, I don't. I'm speechless. Yes. He then put Jessica's pants back on. Thereafter, he located a can of turpentine or paint remover, and he set it by the bed. He then slit both Yolanda and Jessica's throats. Then he took the can of turpentine, he poured the liquid over them, he lit a match, and he threw it on the bed. Paul said he did that to hide the fact that he had slashed their throats. What does it matter? I know. What? Like, <laughs> why? Why? I know. After setting the fire, he took the duct tape, the knife, and the can, and he left the apartment. In this videotaped statement, he indicated also that he could help police with other unsolved cases they had because Yolanda and Jessica were not his first victims. 
I knew it. Yeah. I mean, you know, just like. No, this is all casual, out. right? This is a hardcore crime he just committed. The other unsolved crimes were perpetrated between 1994, when Paul was paroled for an earlier offense, and 1997, when his parole was revoked and he was again incarcerated. Before I tell you about those, however, I'm going to tell you about Paul's very first victim. Paul's first victim, who I will call Mary, went to school with Paul, and she was three years younger. On October 7th, 1987, when Mary was 14 and Paul was 17, Paul asked her to meet him to help a girl they both knew get marijuana out of her house. Paul drove her to his house. They went inside. He motioned for her to go into a certain room, and he struck her over the head, causing her to fall. She was confused and disoriented. Paul then jumped on her, ripped off her clothes, pinned her arms, and put his penis in her mouth. He put a knife to her throat and said, don't bite it or I'll kill you. He handcuffed her hands behind her back and blindfolded her with a bandana. Where'd he get the handcuffs? I know, that's what I was just wondering, right? He's 17. Paul moved her to a bed, handcuffed her to it, and repeatedly ground his penis into her mouth as hard as he could. Oh, God. I know, this poor girl. Paul oh, then, man, I'm sorry. It's like, okay. God, I, I know. hate him. I know, he's disgusting. Paul then stuffed her mouth, I'm not sure what, with, and he put duct tape over it. Then he bit her vagina and pubic area so hard she cried. Why? Why? I don't know. What is this? Then he painfully cut her pubic hair. (gasps) I'm not sure how he did it. He penetrated her vagina, twisted her body, and inserted his penis into her anus, all while she was handcuffed to the bed. Paul removed the gag and repeatedly rammed his penis into her mouth again and threatened her while holding a knife to her throat. He bit her legs and thighs. Bit her, like, everywhere. He's a sadist. Yes. Paul then handcuffed her to a railing in the living room and offered to take her home if she would drink a glass of Seagram's VO. What the fuck is that? So she's like, okay. Okay, sure, absolutely. She finished most of the glass of the alcohol, but then Paul took her to the bathroom where she vomited. He put her in the shower and he raped her again. Mary lost consciousness and woke up later with all four of her limbs cuffed to a bed. Oh, how terrifying. All right. She was gagged, and judging from the sunlight, she knew a few hours had passed from when she passed out. I'm not sure exactly what time she came over his house, but she knew. Paul later handcuffed her to a chair and gave her cereal. When she picked up the chair and tried to escape, Paul held a knife to her throat and threatened her again. He then cuffed her to the kitchen table, cut her hair with a knife, and began cutting the inside of her arms. Paul smiled and said he liked that. Cutting the inside of her arms? Yeah. Hmm. Paul bit her nipples so hard that she cried again. He told her, quote, shut up, that doesn't hurt, end quote. He then bit her neck, breast, stomach, crotch, and legs. He raped her vaginally, then blindfolded her and put the gag back on. Then he recuffed her hands behind her back, put her face down on the sofa, and raped her again. This poor woman, I man. Know. I know. This is how long it's been going on now? This is hours, right? This was back in 19... He's 17. Yeah, wow. You he... don't recover from that. I mean, you don't, you don't change no, from that. No, right? No. He squeezed her buttocks, twisted them, spread them apart. He bit them, mm. saying he wanted to rip off her skin. Oh, God. I know, this is fucked. And then he repeatedly raped her, anally. Paul then, simultaneously, penetrated her with a foreign object and his penis, alternating orifices with the object and his penis. Goddamn! He moved her to another room, removed the gag, and raped her orally. This is, like, I mean, this is a lot of sexual assault. Isn't like, it? This guy is really getting off on I this know, violence. right? It's sick. Mary was on the floor with her hands handcuffed behind her back. She recalled, quote, every bone in my body hurt, end quote. Then she saw Paul grab a fireplace poker. And this is what she said. Oh, fuck. No, no, no. Yeah. She said, quote, he shoved the handle of the fireplace poker in my anus. (gasps) Tanya. I know. He rammed it in as hard as he could. Mm. He started making it go up and down and over and over and out and in. And I felt my insides were getting ripped out. I'm going to be sick. Oh, my God. I kept crying. He kept doing it and doing it. I thought I was going to die because it hurt so bad. 
He just kept doing it, forcing it farther and farther and farther, end quote. Paul stopped when the phone rang. He gagged Mary, bound her ankles, and put her inside of a sleeping bag, then threw her in the crawl space. He told her, don't do anything stupid or he was going to kill her, and then he left her there. With her hands still cuffed and her legs bound, she rolled and hopped until eventually she got outside because there must be like an outdoor entrance to this crawl space. A neighbor who lived across the street saw Mary with her feet and hands tied. She was crying, shaking, hysterical, and had scarves tied around her mouth. The police later determined that Paul's father and brother had gone on a trip for the weekend, so he was home alone all that weekend. As a result of the incident, Paul was convicted of aggravated criminal sexual assault, aggravated kidnapping and armed violence, and was subsequently sentenced to 14 years imprisonment. Mary was the only victim who survived after being attacked by Paul. In the videotape confession, this is what he told the officers about his other victims, about those unsolved cases I told you. So this is when Paul and his wife Charlene are married. So how long did he actually do in prison? He did seven years. Seven years. Yes, because he was out by 1994. So he's like 24, 25 years old. Mm-hmm. And out. And out. After what he just did to Mary. Yes. Paul and his wife, Charlene, were friends with a girl named Stacy Frodel. And Charlene suggested that she and Paul have a threesome with Stacy. In January of 1995, Stacy came over to Paul's house and they all got drunk. According to Paul, Charlene got mad at Stacy and told Paul to kill her. While Stacy slept, Paul took a weight and hit Stacy on the head. And I'm thinking probably like a dumbbell or something. She was handcuffed. Paul then had sex with Charlene. After a while, Paul looked over at Stacy and noticed she hadn't moved and she wasn't breathing. So she had passed away from the blows to her head. The next day, Paul dismembered Stacy mm. in the bathtub. Using a saw, he cut her hands, ankles, legs, arms, torso, and head and placed the body parts in garbage bags. Thereafter, he and Charlene borrowed a car and drove toward Wisconsin, scattering body parts as they went. The fuck? I know. What the fuck? Tell me about it. Almost two weeks later, on January 16th, a dog found a severed leg. Oh, God. In a field near the Illinois border with Wisconsin, like the southern Wisconsin border. It was a German shepherd named Friendly, just FYI. A German shepherd named Friendly? Named Friendly. Found the leg? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And five days after that, Friendly found the other leg. Oh. DNA confirmed that the legs belonged to Stacy. There was other physical evidence, and there was witness statements about what had happened. So the bones showed evidence of cutting. Stacy's skull showed evidence of injury consistent with having been struck by a barbell weight. They took carpet from the bedroom that had Stacy's blood. Regarding a witness, there was a woman that lived with Paul and Stacy. Her name was Dina. She lived with them and said that on January 3rd, 1995, Charlene said that she was looking forward to Stacy coming over for a visit. When Stacy came over, they drank, and eventually Charlene told Dina that Stacy would be staying the night. The next day, Paul and Charlene borrowed Dina's car and used more than half a tank of gas. Dina said she had had sex four or five times with Paul, including a threesome with Charlene, and including the day that Charlene went to the hospital to give birth. Oh, what? Yeah. What? I know, right? Oh. It's fucked. About six months later, on July 12th, 1995, Charlene brought sisters Janeta, who went by Janet, and Amila Pasanbegovic to the ranch home with the intent that they would have a foursome. When Paul suggested that they submit to sex for money, Janet got up and ran upstairs. Paul caught her outside on the driveway and grabbed her hair and pulled her down, and her head hit the concrete driveway. He said, I might have hit her again. In any event, Janet was unconscious by the time Paul was done. Paul then picked her up and brought her back into the house. When Amila saw Janet was unconscious, Amila got up. Paul then dropped Janet on the stairs, grabbed Amila, and took her into the weight room where he handcuffed her to a weight bar. Paul also put Janet in the weight room. Paul then went upstairs to see if the police were coming because maybe somebody outside saw something. But Charlene went outside and cleaned up the blood, and she cleaned it up on the stairs. This makes me wonder about 
the first story you told me of Charlene didn't have something more to do with it. She's obviously I know pretty willing here. Mm-hmm. Right? I know. I wonder. Before I tell you what happens next, we're going to take a break. Once Paul got Janet inside of the weight room, she vomited a black liquid. Paul then proceeded to have oral sex with Amila. Thereafter, he went upstairs to see what was going on. You know, he's wondering if the police have shown up again. And then he went back downstairs and raped Amila while her hands were cuffed behind her back. He ejaculated on her stomach and wiped it off with her clothing. Amila asked about Janet, and Paul took Janet's body and put it in a water-filled bathtub with the shower running. He then left her there. When he came back, she was under the water, and he pulled her up and discovered that she wasn't breathing, so she basically drowned. Well, what did he think was going to happen to her? I know. If she's unconscious and there's already water in the bathtub. Paul then told her sister, Amila, that Janet had drowned. He choked Amila until she passed out. I'm not sure if that's how she died. Thereafter, Paul dismembered both sisters with a saw and put them into eight to ten bags. God damn, I've never even heard of this guy. I know, me either. What the hell? After he ate dinner, he placed the bags in dumpsters in apartment complexes. In Paul's first statement to police, he lied about the location of the murders and the dumpsters in which he deposited the body parts because they took place in DuPage County and apparently DuPage County authorities seemed more intent on pursuing the death penalty, but eventually he did tell them where it actually took place. The next murder that he committed was... I'll use this. This is four that I've told you about. Oh, God. On the morning of January 10th, 1997, Paul was on Tui Avenue when he saw a for sale by owner sign in front of a house. He stopped at the house and knocked on the door. A woman, later known as Dorota Jubik, answered... And Paul thought she was really attractive. He said he was interested in looking at the house, and so she let him in. Paul asked to see the furnace, which she indicated was working sporadically. And he said, oh, I can probably figure out what's wrong with it. When she came over to look at it with him, he grabbed her by the back of the neck and pushed her to the floor. He told her to be quiet if she ever wanted to see her daughter again. Oh, how terrifying. Oh, my God, I know. He walked her into the bedroom and made her perform oral sex on him. Then he told her to lie down and he raped her. Afterward, he took her to the bathroom and told her to wash up as he was concerned about the presence of semen. When she came out of the bathroom, he tied her hands behind her back. He made her lay face down on a pillow on the bed. And what he did then was he leaned on the high part of her back. When he got off of her, she wasn't moving or breathing. Paul grabbed a match and threw it in the closet in an area with paper and clothing. He left after starting the fire. Physical evidence did corroborate aspects of his statement. The fire was reported. Firefighters showed up, and it was coming from the bedroom closet. The fire department determined the fire was deliberately set and could have been started with a match to a piece of clothing in the closet. An autopsy performed on Dorota showed that her body had signs of extensive hemorrhaging in the eyes, hemorrhaging on the vocal cords and in her throat, and a loose joint in the hyoid bone, which are all injuries consistent with manual strangulation. Pressure would have had to have been applied to her neck three and a half to five minutes to cause her death. There was no carbon monoxide or soot in her airways, so she didn't die from smoke inhalation. There was extensive areas of burning to her skin, Photographs of her left and right wrist revealed a red line consistent with some restraints having been placed on her wrist. A couple months later, on March 14, 1997, as Paul was driving in the area of North Kenneth Street in Chicago, he saw another for sale by owner sign in front of an apartment or condominium building. Paul was wearing a 7-Up uniform. What does that mean? I think maybe like people who used to drive... The trucks? Oh, yeah, 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 gotcha. I think. He stopped and he went inside to the unit listed. When a woman answered the door, Paul asked to look at the unit. The woman was Casimira Parouche. She took Paul through the residence. At some point, Paul grabbed her from behind and pulled her on the back of the neck down to the floor. He drove her face into the floor and she just bled everywhere. He stood up and walked her to the bathroom. He raped her in the bathroom and ejaculated on her stomach. 
There was a cabinet in that bathroom, and she reached into it and pulled out an iron, like an iron that you iron, iron clothes, clothes with. with. Yeah. And she tried to swing it at him, but he blocked it with his arm, and the iron flew toward the toilet. At this point, he noticed that her eyes had rolled into the back of her head, and she wasn't breathing. Paul said he poured some liquid on her body, lit a match, and left. Casimira's lower body was unclothed when they found it, and an electrical cord was wrapped around her neck. There was an iron on the floor, but a fire investigator who responded to the scene said when they found her, the cord was wrapped around her neck and there was a large gash to the side of her neck. A pair of bloody jeans was on the floor of the bathroom along with an iron. There was a great deal of blood splatter oh, on the wall, and the fire, they determined, was deliberately set. Kizamira's autopsy reported that approximately 70 to 80 percent of her body was burned, and there was an accelerant they believed that was used. How did he get away with all this? I know, right? I've never heard of this guy. I'm dumbfounded. They found a meat cleaver hanging on the wall of the kitchen that was smeared with Casimiro's blood. So when they did an investigation, they noticed that there was a wound on the right side of her neck that the meat cleaver could have caused. Ah, he you know. chopped her he, neck with a meat cleaver? With a meat cleaver. There, that son of a bitch. I know, this is fucking sick. There were multiple hemorrhages within her neck organs, and the hyoid bone was fractured. So she was strangled. There was some hemorrhaging in her brain and some bruising in the deep brain tissue. They were injuries that were consistent with some sort of blunt trauma to her head, and it could have been that she was struck with the iron. Paul was eventually put on trial. And during his trial, Dr. Michael Stone, who was a clinical psychologist, testified for the defense. Dr. Stone indicated he evaluated Paul, and they had interviews, like face-to-face interviews, for about 90 minutes, once. He diagnosed Paul as a sexual sadist. Well, hello. I know. With borderline antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic features. He described a sexual sadist as someone who derives sexual pleasure from fear, pain, and the restriction of another. He noted there's degrees of sexual sadism corresponding to the person's ability to control violent fantasies and compulsions. So, of course, not all sexual sadists are criminal or homicidal. But he said that Paul demonstrated a minimal ability to control his behavior. Dr. Stone believed that the onset of Paul's sexual sadism occurred at age 17. That's when he raped and tortured poor Mary. And that's when his mother died also around that time. And he said, you know, his mother's death was really traumatic for him and it could have affected his ability to control his sexual sadism. Although Dr. Stone said he couldn't be sure how much Paul's mother's death caused any of the actions, but that his condition worsened over the years with reduced control over his behavior and increased influence of sexual and violent stimuli. Did he say how old he was like when he first started having those sexual feelings? I mean, I know that's how old he was when he acted him out, but... No, but Paul did have some trouble when he was about eight years old. He got expelled from the Catholic school that he was going to at the time because he quote-unquote bothered the girls too much. Oh, he got expelled for it? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, some, that's not just like, oh, I'm a little annoying. That's no. like some serious shit. Yeah, so he was probably like this for a long time. Specifically, Dr. Stone testified that Paul, at the time of the murders, was suffering from a progressive loosening of control and was at risk of impulsively acting out. Under cross-examination, Dr. Stone acknowledged how someone acts upon their sexual sadism is a choice that they make, so Paul did make this choice. In Paul's case, what he did was he would identify particular types of women. He looked for an opportunity, looked for specific vulnerabilities, and he isolated that person in the situation. Dr. Stone acknowledged that Paul would conduct surveillance of a particular woman to determine whether it was feasible to have violent sex with her. Dr. Stone couldn't rule out that Paul's actions included a component of destroying evidence, which, hello, he did. Hello, fire. Hello, fire. Ding, 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 hello. I mean, what is that? I know. He agreed that as a consequence of earlier offenses perpetrated upon a different victim, that was Mary, Paul may have learned that allowing a victim to live after sexual assault could result in his arrest and imprisonment, of course, because that's what happened. But he only got seven years. I know, right? How bad could it be? Dr. Stone did admit that Paul would be less likely to act if police officers were present. And in his notes, he wrote, Paul said he knew exactly what he was doing and that he was aware of the seriousness of his crimes and he took personal responsibility for them. 
There was another doctor that was called by the prosecution, Dr. Dietz. He interviewed Paul and had this to say about whether Paul could control his impulses. Quote, Mr. Runch told me he didn't assault the women in two cases because of the presence of a baby. And then he said he likes babies and didn't want to take their mother away from the baby, and he knew if he raped them, he would probably kill them. What the fuck? I like babies. I like babies, so you know what? I won't. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this one go. Yeah. The doctor said that indicates that he is in control of what he's going to do. He, oh, I mean, what are, what are we arguing about here? That he has absolutely no control? Mm-hmm. Yes. Whether he can so control then it or not So then it's not his fault because he can't control mm-hmm. it? Or what is this? Yeah, about whether what his level of guilt is. Mm. Oh. He already had the intent. He already picked a target. He made his plan. And yet something as simple as seeing a baby there allowed him to stop and leave. So he said this couldn't occur if he was in some sort of frenzy, like some sort of weird sexual sadist frenzy. Following the presentation of evidence at the guilt or innocence phase of the trial, the jury was instructed that it could find Paul not guilty of the murders, not guilty by reason of insanity, guilty but mentally ill, or guilty of the murders. After deliberating, the jury rejected verdicts based upon psychological impairment, and they found him guilty of the first-degree murders of Yolanda and Jessica. In addition to the evidence of Paul's seven murders and eight sexual assaults, the state presented evidence of Paul's escape from DHS custody. And I'm including this because it is sort of weird. On October 6, 2000, Rick Schroeder, <laughs> Ricky Schroeder, not the Ricky I Schroeder. I get it. I get it. Of DHS was transporting three DHS recipients, including Paul, and an inmate named Conley from Sheridan Correctional Facility to court in Cook County. Paul and Conley were restrained with leg shackles and walking restraints. En route, Conley complained that he was sick. Once the vehicle stopped, Conley said, hey, Rick. And when Schroeder turned around, he was sprayed in the face and felt a sharp pain in his eye. He stumbled across the street, and when he regained some degree of vision, he noticed glass on the highway on the passenger side of the van. Paul and Conley were gone. Schroeder was taken to the hospital and missed work for five weeks. Sergeant Greg Bell of the Napier Police Department received a dispatch about the escape and positioned his patrol car to monitor traffic. He saw a car fitting the description of the vehicle given in the dispatch followed it, and eventually pulled the car over. The officers drew their weapons, and Paul, a female, and a third person were arrested. The woman informed the police that there was a gun in the car. They did find wrist shackles and leg shackles. There was a homemade knife and a handcuff key, pepper spray. All kinds of shit was in this car. Paul told police that he and Conley began devising a plan to escape about six months in advance. Paul noticed that the Illinois Department of Corrections guards no longer accompanied unarmed DHS guards in what transportation. What is DHS? He's the Department of Human Services. What is he doing with them, though? They're the ones that were transporting individuals to and from court. Oh, okay. So somebody from the Department of Corrections didn't go with them. Okay. So and pa- they're unarmed? They're unarmed, which makes no sense. Paul befriended a DHS guard named Doris Harper. Oh, poor Doris. I hope they didn't become good friends. Yeah, they did. But he described their relationship as romantic, but not sexual. Oh. Pursuant to the plan, Doris provided two cans of pepper spray inside the facility. Paul also received a handcuff key from Doris via another DHS guard. Doris purchased clothing for Paul and had $2,000 cash to be used en route to Mexico after the escape. She also arranged for a rental car and was to follow the van to Cook County until the escape. Doris was then going to drive Paul and Connolly away. Phone records show multiple calls to Harper's home from July through October of 2000. The rear cargo area of Doris's car was located with clothing, duffel bags, a 25 caliber handgun, ammunition. The car also contained a bolt cutter. This is unbelievable. I know. Inside her home, police found a notebook containing step-by-step directions from the prison facility to the courthouse in Chicago. Doris. Doris. Girl, what the fuck are you thinking? I know. During the penalty phase, Ramon Rivera, who was Yolanda's father and Jessica's grandfather, read a victim impact statement in which he described the many positive attributes of Yolanda and Jessica, the loving relationship he had with them, and the horror that he experienced upon learning the circumstances of their death. Also in mitigation, Doris testified that the escape from DHS custody was all her idea. And Paul told her to pull over when she noticed the police vehicle behind them. Oh, shut the fuck up. 
She stated that she had become, quote, emotionally attached, quote, to Paul, and had circumstances been different, she would have been intimate with him. The plan. How, how does one become emotionally attached to that fucker? I know. To a fucking serial killer? The plan had been for her and Paul to escape to Mexico and have a quote unquote long term relationship. Doris described Paul as mannerly, charming, and smart. Very charming. Very apparently. She was equivocal when she was asked if she had been manipulated, stating, quote, I really don't know. I can't say either way, end quote. She admitted that she gave Paul a handcuff key and mace to facilitate the escape and compiled an array of supplies, including weapons and furtherance thereof. Now, I told you a little bit when Paul was in Catholic school, how yeah. he had been expelled. His adopted father, Richard Runge, testified that he and his wife had adopted Paul as an infant. So just telling you a little bit about him. At age two, Paul lost consciousness briefly after a fall from a grocery cart, but no medical oh. treatment was ever sought. I know he oh. fell out of a cart. When he was eight, he was expelled from Catholic school. At age 11, he used a knife to cut up a table and his father's thermal underwear. That's really fucking weird. Paul told his parents he was just playing, but they were concerned because he wasn't conversing with them and they sent him to counseling. At age 14, he had sex with two girls his age, and he was arrested for that as the girls initially claimed they had been attacked. But later at the police station, the girls said it was consensual and Paul was allowed to go home. At age 15, Paul had consensual sex with a woman catering a wedding event he attended with his parents. Hmm. I know. Mr. Runge testified that Paul was emotionally close to his adoptive mother, and she passed away when he was 17, as I told you. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's the catalyst to him being a fucking psycho. Being a fucking weirdo. After hearing all the testimony, the jury returned a death penalty verdict. However, in 2011, Illinois abolished the death penalty, and therefore, he is now serving a sentence of life without parole. In case you were wondering, Charlene received immunity unbelievable yes for testifying against what? paul mm-hmm. wow so i think some of these details because this came from the court record some of these details probably came from her mm. in her testimony what a psycho bitch i know got immunity it's mm. fucked up dude so thank you everyone for listening this week wow thank you for that never heard of that this crazy son of a bitch I know. man i know god and if you'd like to see pictures of Hot to trot Paul Runge. Does he think he's some sort of super <laughs> I think sexy? he did. Didn't you say you looked him up and he called him the Playboy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he ain't. Mm-mm. He ain't no Playboy. He's no Brad Pitt. Go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. You can find out more information also there about becoming a member of our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, where you can find hundreds of bonus episodes. Billions. <laughs> You also get early release of our weekly episode, and you also get the weekly episode ad-free if you join our Patreon. You can do it. You can do it. You can also find the same episodes if you listen on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, and you get the same exact episodes and the same benefits. Absolutely. You can find us on social media, at Hardcore True Crime on Instagram and Facebook. And is there anything else to leave? I don't know. I don't know I don't, I don't know. We do this every week I know, and I, I can't don't know. ever remember I don't know. half the time. So anyway. It sounds good to me. <laughs> I think I did. I mentioned our website. I think I got it. Until our next episode, everyone. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.